everybody, my name's Pete Brown. I'm a beer writer and broadcaster. And today for Cask Ale Week, I'm delighted to be talking to Ed Hughes, who's uh, someone I've known for, for many years. We meet at beer festivals and events uh, and places, other places where Ed wows people uh, about beer and the potentiality for it and how wonderful it is, especially people who don't really know that they love beer as much as they're going to. So, Ed, hello. That was very kind. Hello, Pete. That was very kind. <laughs> I do try and wow people. It doesn't always work, but we talk about beer. We've got a good job to do, haven't we? Well, you surprise people with it, don't you? Yeah, I think that's the thing. You know, I'm sure we're gonna, we, we'll are gonna we chat through it. I think, you know, I, I, I'm completely biased. You know, I think beer's magic um, and all forms of beer. Um, and hopefully we can sort of encourage to enthuse, enthuse the masses about this as well. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I do a bit of what you do, not quite in the same, with the same panache as you. Um, but uh, one of the joys of, because neither of us are, are brewers, no. per se. Um, and one of the joys in, in my job is, is seeing that light go on when you give someone a, a taste, of a flavour experience that they've, that they've never had before. That's and, ex uh, exactly it, mate. That is exactly it. It's when you see that penny drop of someone that haven't, haven't, like you said, haven't realised that they like beer because they haven't tried the right one. I genuinely believe there's a beer out there for everyone. Um, Absolutely. Um, and that I just don't think that they've discovered it if they categorically say, I don't like beer. That's like categorically saying, I don't like music. It doesn't, it doesn't exactly in my mind, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, let's, we'll talk a, a bit more about, about what you do and how you do it and also about how this relates to the fact that we're, we're doing this to, to, to help celebrate Cask Ale Week. But um, how did you find yourself in a position where you make a living by trying to get people to drink beer? Um, it, it, all by chance, really. I, I, I uh, sort of grew up down here in Cornwall. I grew up in Rock, like a mile away from, from Sharp's Brewery itself. Um, and I'd never visited the brewery. I didn't know a lot about beer as, as you do growing up. And then I moved up to Nottingham. Um, I won't give you my life story, but basically <laughs> I went to study in Nottingham um, right. and end up working in bars and restaurants. You know, from an early age, I've worked in cafes and bars and restaurants. And you know, that, was, that was the thing to do when you're a student. Um, and I thoroughly enjoyed working in bars. I ended up running a cocktail bar in Nottingham. And just the enthusiasm in... in the front of house and sort of that scene is is amazing and quite infectious as well and i won an upselling competition of who garden and uh, with a load of bar managers around around the country i got sent to the who garden brewery that was my beer epiphany pete to to go i've never actually been to the brewery i've been to a lot of belgian breweries but i've not been to that one what was it like it's just amazing and and i think that was again that one of my beer epiphanies was going to Belgium and it wasn't about the strong beers. It wasn't just about the variations of beers. It was the respect and reverence that the Belgians have for beer. You know, we talk, I talk a lot about how we put wine on a pedestal and spirits on a pedestal. And especially in this country, we look at beer as a consumable um, when it comes mm. to the masses. Whereas it's not like that over there. There's history and a story and a glass to go with every brewery or every beer coming out of every brewery. That's what, that's what I, that was like my first sort of epiphany. Long story short, I came back down to Cornwall um, and worked in some restaurants and some fine dining restaurants. I worked for Nathan Outlaw as, as a restaurant manager. Um, and uh, Sharps had a, a very small, uh, small brews of what was, there was Massive Ale, there was St. Erdoc Double. These were beers uh, of Stuart Howe's creation. Um, and that was epiphany number two. Um, and I wanted to pair, because I've done a, quite a lot of training in spirits and wine, I wanted to pair these beers. So, you know, Massive Ale, which is the beer that ended up being quadruple ale, mm. amazing with a cheese board, but equally amazing with like a chocolate fondant. And, uh, and it, I, I kept on sort of, looking around me going why isn't anyone doing this beer and food thing because the only thing that i that i'd seen in the past is a pie and a pint or you know a lager and a curry and they're lovely but also widely accepted beer matches but i was i was working for you know one of my food heroes nathan um and he he saw the potential in beer and food as well um and then again long story short ended up leaving the restaurant um because on a friday at the brewery at Sharps, 
because they saw my interest in beer, they have a tasting panel. So it's a quality control panel um, of right. the brew of Doombar because we've got an incredible lab at the brewery um, and labs will give you the green light on acidity, on CO2 and the, all the physical chemistry stuff. Um, but what gives us the green light for Cascale at the brewery is two o'clock. We have a tasting panel of 13 odd people that um, taste every brew, um, small amounts, and make sure that it's fit to leave the blue gates at the brewery. And I, I thought this was amazing because I, I didn't realize the work that goes into to brewing beer, Cascale, mm. Cascale especially, but not only that, the, the, the battle that the brewers have to keep consistency. For me, consistency is absolutely king in, in any sort of service industry. Um, and the work that goes into that, that flavor profile being as close as possible as the last week's brew, um, which is necessarily a sort of a, a, an impossible task as well with ingredients yeah. changing. Um, and that was it. I was hook, line and sinker. So I, I, I left working for Nathan to go and work in the shop at the brewery. And that was 11 years ago, just over 11 years ago. And I haven't looked back, Pete. Fantastic, fantastic. I, I, I want to become, if I can, become one of a few themes if I remember them that, that, you, that you mentioned. But I thought that was really interesting when you were talking about the, the difference between, you know, the, the flavour panel with uh, the technical aspects and, and and what we both do in different ways now, which is trying to communicate it in a more general thing. So so we could we could sit and have a conversation about a beer sample and talk about it it being estery uh, or or about it having diacetyl yeah. or, or about all these other things and that's how we tend to talk about it in this little bubble yeah. and and none of that means anything to most people who just enjoy a beer you've got to find a different language yeah. or a different way yeah. to, to 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 try and express flavor and describe flavor with with, with, with other people and, it, and it's a I, I find that the hardest part of my job because flavor is so subjective uh it, it's it, it's it, it's it's so hard to pin down a lot of a lot of the language around it you kind of you can say well this tastes like chocolate well what's chocolate tastes like well it's a bit nutty well what's nutty tastes like well it's a bit coffee-ish well what's coffee and you just keep going on so so this is uh how have you navigated that side of things um it took me a long time uh, because I went into full beer geek mode after sort of really falling in love with beer and Cascale in particular, I was reading everyone's blog. I was reading your blog and I was reading Zach Avery's blog and you know all of, all of these people that are writing about beer. But it wasn't till about four years into becoming a beer geek that I realised, as you said, it's a really small bubble of people. Whereas working events... I, I got to talk to non-beer drinkers and again, diacetyl, looking for all the off flavors or even nuances between different types of IPA or different beer styles. The general public in, in a lot of cases didn't know the difference between ale and lager. And, and, and that was another moment for me to sit back and go, wow, you know, I'm talking about hot varieties, whereas in fact, we need to step back as an industry, we need to step back and let's just talk about the basics, you know, because if we look at the wine world, and I always compare the beer world to the wine world, because I think it's a, it's a relative comparison. The average wine drinker, and I know these are broad sweeping statements, but it, it sort of helps with my conviction. The average wine drinker knows great variety, country, maybe region, and will understand it's a new world or old world wine. Whereas the average beer drinker, can't tell us the difference between a lager and an ale. That's where we, mm. as a collective, we need to try harder to go right back to basics for people, you know, and chat about the history because there's as much, if not arguably more history when it comes to beer, but th those stories haven't been told enough. So we need to do a little bit of a re rewind into, yeah. into the basics. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I, I, I agree with you about wine and it's a very useful comparison, but I, I remember 20 years well maybe a bit more than 20 years ago if you talk to the average person about wine and, and i agree that they now people know if they prefer a sauvignon to a chardonnay and they, they they know if they're like a new world versus an old world and they they they, they have a, an idea about you know acidity versus versus sweetness and that kind of thing but 20 odd years ago it was like well there's red wine and there's white wine yeah. and you have, you have you have red wine with red meat and you have white wine with fish yeah. and that was the average person's level of of knowledge so, yeah. so the wine industry has done a brilliant job 
uh, over the last 20 years. What, you know, I mean, you, you've had a lot of exposure to that. What, what do you think, and, and you know, I guess you're putting into practice every, every day, but, but what, what, what can be a learn from wine in terms of how they've done that job? Um, I think signposting is a big one. Um, we are so lucky as beer drinkers, Pete, and I'm sure you agree, the proliferation of breweries and beer styles and beers full stop. There's so many beers now, you know, just if we see it in the, in the last 10 years or so, um, but the signpostings aren't always there. You know, the bonus with a, with a pub, um, it, they're nice, clear sort of pump clips or clear lenses. But if you go into a supermarket, you've now got mm. this huge amount of, of beers and you've got wheat beers next to double IPAs because of maybe the way the label looks rather than you walk down a wine aisle, you have South Africa. I know I can walk to South Africa and get a Stellenbosch Chenin Blanc, you know, and, and that's, that's, so in, I, I like the 20 years behind thing because I, I see the education, we're, we're probably 20 years behind and that's where we just need to close that gap and we need to accelerate that as well. You know? so, so what's it, I mean, we're, we're, all of our jobs are a bit weird now, uh, hence us <laughs> yes, having this conversation from my studies. Is that your living room? It is indeed, yes. Very, very, very nicely, tastefully done. I have to Thank say. Thank you very much. Um, but, but you know, so we're all, but if you, if we think back, if we kind of abstract the current situation, what what's your typical job? What does a typical day look like? Typical day outside of this situation, I work in a huge amount of events, and I know, you know, we've seen each other at various times. Whether it's the London Beer Weeks, Taste of London, we do a lot of music and food events, things like Big Festival, we've got Panto Christmas Festival down here, and we have this. Um, experience called the secret bar and that's that's been pivotal for me really and and our team because it's all about beer and food and I you know it's tricky to pinpoint a day to day because every day is different for me but as a beer sommelier you know beer is always at the forefront but there's the events part of it but I also oversee the shop at the brewery as well where I started which is lovely and I've got an amazing team there you know in next year it's all about doing brewery tours and hosting and getting this education piece piece right really a um, bit of tourist information, ultimately, of, of telling the stories and, yeah, and educating people about beer, wh whether it's bar managers to, to buyers for supermarkets. Um, from a, and as you said, from a non-brewer's perspective, um, you know, I'm, I'm an enthusiast and, and I think, yeah, and it seems to, seems to go a long way, which is really, really nice. Yes. It's funny, isn't it? We talk about education and, um, and I've been to some, I've been to some beer tasting and so, some beer and food matching events where you've got some incredible plates of food that a really amazing chef has done, um, put together and really thought about beer either as an ingredient or as a pairing or, or as both. Yeah. Um, and maybe different beers, maybe one beer in the dish and another beer as, as the pairing. And, and when people stand up to introduce uh, the pairing and tell, talk about it, they say, OK, we've got some work to do now. Uh, I want you to really work on this. I want you to, I want you to find the flavours that go together. And I'm sitting there, bloody hell, I just came out for a, for yeah. a nice meal, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what, I mean, I, I found, I've, I've been to your, uh, I've been to your secret bar twice and found it hugely entertaining. Um, what's the, what's the trick of, of dressing education about beer up in a, in a, in a way that people actually like and, and they, and, and it's fun, you know, learning by stealth because you're just enjoying yourself. Yeah. And it is literally creating memories for people, but also conversing with people. Because as much as, you know, I have the utmost respect for the wine world, sometimes the wine, world's, wine world can be slightly dictatorial, or they will tell you that this works with that. Whereas I ask people, what do you like? You know, the easy yeah. way to sort of break the ice, as it were, ask them about film and music, and then you talk about the subjectivity of taste that you've already mentioned. Just because, you know, I like a Doom bar, it doesn't mean that another person will, because we've got different tastes. As long as people are willing to give it a go, one, the beer on its own, two, the beer with the food, because you might not like a, a certain Barolo, for instance, or a big heavy red, but with that steak or with that venison, that wine will take on a completely different world, completely different flavour profile, and how it works with the food isn't necessarily how it works on its own. And, and that, those, are the, those are the conversation pieces, rather than telling people that goes with that and not a lot and that power of suggestion. You just ask people, do you like it? And if you don't like it, what would you, what would you empower people to, to make up their own mind rather than listen to me 
and reel off loads of tasting notes. Um, and because I do this for a job, people feel it's terribly British as well. People feel very agreeable. Go, I'll agree with that yes. chap because he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> but the whole point is, it's it's up to everyone else, you know, because there is, you know, it's different people have different tastes, and I think that's that's the way that I I engage with 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 everyone I do a tasting with, really. So so let's move on to to Cascale then, because it is it is Cascale Week, and that's yeah, why we're here. Indeed. And uh, and the company you work for produces the number one selling yeah. Cascale in the yeah. in the country. Yeah. So so you're pretty well qualified to to talk about that. Um, you, you 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 gave us an outline of your your beer epiphany and and your your first journey. When did you realise that Cascale was a thing? That that was that there was something different about it. That it was a kind of it, it was a separate entity from from the rest of the beer world. Or I, I'm, I'm not even sure I'm putting that right. But, I, but I what, what, was, what was your first impression of Cascale? I think there's two bits again. One working in Nottingham, and we had Cascale on, um, and I had to do a cellar course. Um, whereas changing a barrel or changing a keg is plug and play. Opening a bottle is opening a bottle, and then to do a full day cellar course on how to keep Cascale, how to be a cellarman or a cellar person was amazing because i didn't realize you know i'd always been the other side of the bar um and i'd drink a, a tetley top for instance that was my first mm. go-to pub call um in my first bar job down here in cornwall um whereas realizing that there are different vessels in this wonderful place that you never see when you are on the other side of the bar um and the work that goes into it and sort of time passed and i'd forgotten about it because i wasn't working in bars i was working in restaurants that was all packaged sort of bottles um uh, bottled beers and then going to the brewery and that tasting panel with stewart and the guys at sharks realizing the work that goes into it and how a cask is you know the, the simple stuff of that lovely sort of bellied container that is specifically designed for the the yeast to settle there is there's something very elegant about Cascale, and it's not to take anything away from bottle or keg, but you have to treat it differently. You know, there's the care and attention. You can't disturb a cask. There's something magical and delicate about cask, um, and the fact that it's living. You know, that sediment mm. is there, and it must be drunk fresh because that's why we brew the beer. You know, that's that's that three day rule, um, and this is part of the edu education piece that. You know, you learn something every day. But I think that was when I started working at the brewery and I was filling mini mini casks and poly boxes for the guys in the in the shop, just talking about bright beer and how that sediment settles in eight to twelve hours. And that's when it's all about timing and that that sort of romanticism around cask. But like I said, mm. it's, that, it's that care and attention that, that cask is is unique and it's ours, you know. It is it is the British the British style of beer or the, the British packaging, you know, and it's, um, it's an institution for, for our country, really. But th this is something that I, I, I struggle with quite a lot, because I, I, I do quite a bit of work myself with, with trying, to, uh, try, trying to educate people around Cascale. And, and I think there's a, you've, you've talked about, uh, there's, a, there's a magic if you're into it, which is, which is this kind of thing, it's a special life product, it's not like other beer, it requires more care and attention. Uh, it is a living thing. It's a bit trickier to deal with. If, 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 I'm a, if I'm a drinker who is rolling up to the bar and it's like, right, what do I fancy today? Um, you know, I'm, I, might be, I might be having a gin, I might be having a lager, I might be having a, a soft drink. All that special care and attention and, and tradition, what, what does that actually mean for the drinker? What, what do I get out of it if, I, if, I, if I'm just a general drinker? Why is it special? Why should I care? Well, I think, you know, if, if we're going super traditional, we're thinking of a beer engine and that handful, and it's back to the language around it. It's not um, theatre and style over substance. There is something different about that liquid, and I think that's up to us for the signposting piece, whether it's on a, on a coaster that people can pick up just the different bits of information about, mm. you know, temperature or whatever it would be. And I think that's where we can enthuse people because i think at the moment people are uh, habitual drinkers as well they they're very brands led which is understandable but every beer has a story as well um and as a category i think we need to be a united front as as any any brewer of cascade going 
just get those simple signposts out there for people. And I think that's how then the drinker can differentiate between this sort of handful versus opening a bottle mm. or pouring pouring a keg. You know, and again, even keg pouring in, in the continent is very different from how we do it here as well. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I, I was doing some research on this uh, for an industry report, and um, it was quite interesting. We, we were talking to occasional drinkers of people who describe themselves as occasional drinkers of Cascale rather than regular drinkers. And, um, and when you dig into it, occasionally meant, well, I might have a pint when I go to see my dad at Christmas, or I might have a pint if we go to, if we do a weekend break uh, in the, a short break in the countryside uh, and things like that. And, and for them, it just felt like part of a traditional pub. And when we got onto it, they said, well, the, the thing about cask is, if it's a proper pub, there should be a row of those hand pumps there. And there should be some old blokes standing in front of them. And, and it should all feel nice and cosy and warm. I don't necessarily want to drink it myself, but it's not a proper pub mm. if it's not there. Yeah. And it sort of reminded me, I thought, if, if, if you get someone who doesn't like spicy curries, but they go to an Indian restaurant, they might never order the vindaloo. Mm. But if the restaurant doesn't serve a vindaloo, you're like, hang on a minute, is this a proper Indian restaurant? Yeah. And it's, it's those images that, that are conjured up. And I, and I like, you know, for people to talk about that uh, occasional drinking. Uh, and again, you know, we'll sort of come into at the moment in this current situation. But they're quite special occasions. You know, if, if it is to go back to meet the family, to go to the local that, that's from your hometown, and you know they keep their beer well. Because that's a phrase that I really like um, that, that can be, there is the stigma attached to how beer is kept, but to, for credibility, for being an ex-barman, of knowing that I'll get a regular customer in because I, I know you keep your beer well, that's like a, mm. you should get a badge or a medal for that because it's, again, no mean feat, really. Um, and we want those occasional drinkers to look at, to look at cask of not just on those occasions. Um, that if they like it, why do they only drink it when they're sort of going back home or they're at this special occasion? It's the same as, you know, I suppose having a, having a lager in a curry house. Lager's wonderful. Um, yeah. Why don't you drink lager all the time? And it's, it's sort of those, those conversation points and those questions that we need to ask people. Yeah, but if you're going to have, so if, if you're going to have a lager with a curry and you're going to have a glass of champagne on your birthday and you're going to have a, a, a pink gin cocktail on a Friday night party, when... When is when is your perf when 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 will when it when will only a pint of cask do? Oh, I've thought about that a lot over the, especially over the last six months waiting for pubs to open. Bonus is I, I can get cask ale in in mini cask from work. Um, <laughs> there are there are two things for me um, that conjure up um, for me. There's one of going into the pub where I can see the sea um, and probably having a ploughman's as traditional as this stands. And I've, I've been really lucky to work with loads of wonderful chefs and there's always a test a chef will do for any food-led pub. How's your ploughman's? Or there's one chef in particular, Paul Ripley, that used to be the head chef at Stein's. He was like, how's the pub ploughman's? And if they keep their beer well and they do a really good ploughman's, that is, that's a lovely moment because it's about taking your time and having little bites. I suppose it's a little bit like tapas. You don't have to sort of scoff it down. Um, the other one would be watching a game of cricket on a sunny day outside. Yeah. Pint of cascale. That, that, that first point, so it reminds me of the quote that's attributed to Ferran Adria when, when uh, people go to his restaurant to try and get a job cooking this incredible molecular yeah. cuisine, the cutting edge of something, and he says, make me an omelette. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and if you can't make a basic two-egg omelette, it won't trust you to do all the fancy stuff either. And I, I totally get that, but I've, I've never heard that about the pub and the, the ploughman's before. But but yeah, if you if you can't put a decent plate together, some good cheese and some good yeah. um, some good bread, and serve it with a pint of well kept ale, then you probably shouldn't be doing the job. <laughs> exactly. Or you know, it's it's hard to come from sort of that judgment point. Um, but that's that's what a pub should do, you know. And we're we're lucky, you know, we're in this country. You know, pubs are the institution. And it doesn't have to be dry ice and, and theatre. And I'm a big fan of theatre, as you know. But actually, the basics, basics done well, that's, that's the way forward, really. I, I wonder a bit about this, um, and I, I've written about this recently from a food perspective, but, but the, the basics done well, th there's nothing better. And, and if, if, if you were a typical Brit and you went to 
to Italy or Spain or, or France and you're out in the countryside, you'd be going, right, I want to I have what the locals drink. I want to have... Uh, I want to have the local speciality and, and, a, and a piece of locally made cheese or some locally cured ham yeah. with, with, you know, the, the local wine or whatever. You'd go, there's nothing better than this. It's the simple stuff done well that they do here. Now, when tourists come to this country, they do exactly the same. And they say, right, I need proper British ale yeah. in a proper British pub. And we kind of do it down a bit. We kind of think, oh, well, it's, it's, it's ours. So it's probably not as, not as good as everybody else. Yeah, there's the, there's the, I suppose the humble nature of of us, but also there's a, that little bit of pride. And, and I, I realized this for working so many years front of house. No one told me as a career, you should be a restaurant manager. I, I think it was back in the day, very early computers. I think I did a, a questionnaire and I was either going to be a biochemist or a binman. And neither one really ticked the box for me. I want to be a marine, <laughs> marine biologist. Um, but that didn't work either. Um, but I loved working in, in restaurants and bars and I, and I realized that I was quite good at it. But even being good at, good at sort of that, that job, no one ever said, you could do this for a career. I'm now really lucky to work with loads of chefs and loads of wonderful restaurant managers, operations managers, um, and you know, some of the, the pub chains, um, that it's hard work. And I think that's where we don't think about that. You know, there's the humble nature of, of us as Brits, but there's also going, or oh, do that till you get a proper job. Whereas in fact, take this really seriously and be proud of what we have and our heritage um, and the plowmans and that pie, you know, and how we've influenced other countries rather than always thinking it's yeah. better than us. And Cascale is a really good place to start because we are the best in the world. Um, I, I, I came to the conclusion with my food book that the Brits, it is a kind of quiet pride and that it, we, we don't want, with cuisine, it's like we don't necessarily want British food to be, to have, be flair and kind of really fancy and stuff, but we want it done really well. There's, a, there's an arts to the proper Sunday roast, just as it is to the plowman, just as it is to the, uh, to the full English breakfast. And cask is a great example of that, isn't it? It's not a, it's not a flashy beer. It, it's not kind of a insanely hoppy or or sour, well, it shouldn't be sour. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but it's just a kind of a quiet beer done really well. And it and it's a beer that just reveals itself gradually. It yeah. just like as you said, and the, the the kind of typical, you know, I've I'm a I'm a bit of a northern cliche, but uh coming from Yorkshire, but it's that it's that kind of big old sip and then you go, Good bit of beer that. Yeah. That's a good good drop that. You know, it's just that's yeah. that's about as far as it goes, isn't it, for most yeah. people. But balance and elegance. And I think that's, exactly. that's one thing that we don't talk about um, because we're, um, we can be seduced by wow in, in gastronomy, in beer or anything else. But actually balance and elegance is, for me, one of the most underrated things, in, especially in making beer, is making something consistent and elegant is, is very, very hard to do because a lot of people can do wow. You know, again, a chef can make... A, a chocolate dessert but then do dry ice and have loads of aromas and you're like wow but how's the chocolate dessert how does it taste are you again seduced by the flair the style over substance and there is something to be sort of hand on heart and go we're doing a really good job you know because that beer is consistent i i i love that and i don't think we we i don't think we we shout about that enough and that's what cascale can do as well Exactly. And I, I, I get reminded of this when I talk to American brewers, some, some of the early leading lights of the American craft beer revolution, which everyone's now enjoying all over the world. Yeah. And you say to them, what, what do you, they just go, I wish I could just have a great pint of Cascale. Yeah. And, and, and some of those brewers were inspired by working in the UK. And you know, the, the guy who founded Goose Island in Chicago yeah. used, to, used, to, used to get off the plane at Heathrow and go to the Star Tavern in Belgravia to drink london pride and that's yeah. what that's what he wanted to do when he when he quit so i, th I think yeah it, it would be good if we could be prouder of cascale as, as our kind of unique tradition that's admired by everybody else around the world but yeah probably in a in a modest and unassuming way i suppose yeah yeah and i think this is the whole vehicle you know the whole point of cascale is to to celebrate it and celebrate pubs and we need to support pubs at the moment as well you know we've you know it, not to dwell on it but we've all we've all been through this very odd situation that you know every pub in the land closed, you know, and that that was 
that was very strange. You know, we didn't expect it, um, but people missed it. And actually, hopefully, when people now go into a, to a pub, you can't sit at the bar. You now sort of, you know, hopefully they they get a pint of cask ale and sit down, whether it's you know, two people or six people, and really think about where that beer has come from. Now's the time to mm. to have these conversations with people, especially people that want to listen as well. You know, and I think absolutely. Really Absolutely. I mean, it was interesting. I think the, um, I think getting pubs open again showed up some of the, some of the quirks of cast, didn't it? Because it was it was it two weeks notice that we yeah. had before yeah. July fourth. Yeah, and, and and breweries were closed down. It's like okay, just whip us up some beer. Yeah, yeah, because I think, I think that's the thing. I think opening, reopening all of the breweries is hard work because it, it doesn't happen overnight. And I, and I think this is back to this is a lovely way to talk about it is for people to know that you don't, you don't just brew a beer and it's done in 24 hours. Everything takes time to get the malt in. You know, certain varieties of yeast, don't, you have to order four weeks in advance. We didn't have that. So, you know, even now we're, we're several months in where we're still just trying to keep up. And that's where we've prioritized as a business. We prioritized the beers that we know will go out there. You know, the other beers will come in, in good time, but we need to get, you know, it's those baby steps you need to get the right things right to start off with um and it's you know i don't think the brewing industry talked about its challenges as much as possibly the restaurant industry did um because getting a supply chain of yeah of uk and ireland distribution is is very hard to go from naught to 60 you know as, as, mm. as the pubs opened um and and it, it was lovely you know and i you know i know you had a, a very a very interesting story of that that first pint that you had Yes, and that's back to the pride of front of house staff. Um, but that was a fantastic. I'm sure that beer tasted amazing, um, and I think that that's it, really, isn't it? I think it remind. I think I think it. I think it's uh, absolutely. Um, there's there are some basics about drinking in a pub. So I mean, I've I've really enjoyed some. Oh, I don't know about you, but over lockdown, really enjoyed some amazing beers. Uh, really got into kind of ordering. Uh, cases of can be mixed cases of beer from local breweries and having them delivered the next day and, and all that kind of stuff is fantastic but yeah my first pint back in a pub was uh, a, a pint of Peroni served in a Dunbar glass because yeah. that was all they had and it, it's it's the feel of a pint in your hand it's the temperature it's the situation it's the fact that you're you're near other people but not engaging with them so there's still this sense of communality and atmosphere I, yeah. I I think a lot of us realised how much we missed pubs when we when we couldn't go to them anymore. Yeah, yeah, and, and as I said, you know, hopefully people make the most of everything that goes into to having a pub and and running a pub as well, and how hard the teams are working to keep pubs open, and but also all the people behind it, the the food suppliers, the drink Definitely. suppliers, you know, and and that's it. it, it this is the time for galvanising the industry for me. Yeah, and they've got all these extra challenges now, and. Uh, things that they weren't trained for, things that they didn't want to make up. But my experience of great pubs in the limited time I've been back is that great pubs are run by people who just have, who are just talented, who just can react to situations and stuff. And they're not, they weren't expect to react to a situation like this, but I've been to some pubs where you've got screens in place, you've got social distancing, you've got your temperature checked, and it still feels like a great pub. It still feels like a welcoming, warm environment with a, with yeah. a great atmosphere. I don't know how they do that. No, and, and this is why I'm glad I'm not in the industry anymore. You know, I, I, <laughs> I've, I've been, you know, I, I'm on the periphery, but, you know, I've been chatting to the guys down at the Mariners, you know, our, our, our partnership with Paul Ainsworth down the road in Rock, and it is, the, the, the place is magic, and the hard work that they've put in to change everything they know about, um, well, it's not everything they know, to change the way they serve people from wanting people to come in and welcoming people in, to go and sorry you can't come in we're full at the moment that they've become doorman and their service levels was already it was fantastic and it's they've just gone up a, another notch and those those are the people that will survive through this as well that have they've had to embrace it and we've had to diversify pete you've had to diversify by not being out and about i i've had to do the same thing i think everyone's had to reflect on going right we're gonna have to do it a different way and accept that as well and i think those people that welcome that change that they, they'll 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 do well out of this yeah so we should all be kind of giving a a bit of help and support when we, when we do go to pubs and being a bit patient 
with, with staff who are having to deal with everything they used to deal with and a loads more new stuff besides. Um, but isn't there, a, coming back to Cask, I'm going to totally ask a question now, which you'll never get away with in a kind of professional interview because I'm just putting words into your mouth. <laughs> um, but um, in, um, uh, with, with all the, with, with, with new restrictions still being issued on a seemingly random basis, uh, we can't now play live music in pubs, we can't sing, we can't shout, um, we, we, we can't mingle between tables, we can't, all, all of, but we can still go to the pub and sit and have a quiet pint. Mm. I believe that this drives pubs towards a kind of atmosphere and a situation where Cascale is actually the perfect drink to be having. Do you agree? <laughs> I'm completely biased, Pete, um, but I do agree. And it was actually back to that point of rethinking things because I, I hadn't, hadn't really thought about it because we see the restrictions because actually it, there, there's a lovely link into that, the time it takes for care and attention actually to sit down and have that pint. There is a gentle calm and there is a making that moment count moment with cast, even from the point of that, you know, that slow handful of, mm. and again, if we can get some of that sort of seller chat in there in the future, then people appreciating that that cask ale is hopefully now's the time to, to do it because you sit down, you sit down at a table, you have to now, and it's either with one other person or with five other people. Um, and to sit down and see what people are drinking rather than sort of leaning on the bar and just drinking beer because that's, the, you know, mm. even beer is a category, you know. I think to sit down and actually see what you're drinking and really taste it. I know it sounds really silly because sometimes we just drink beer, chat, drink beer. Um, but if you put beer into a brandy balloon, this is one of the tricks that I do in tasting. To put beer into a brandy balloon, people look at that liquid like it's completely different. But it's exactly the same beer as you put into a pint glass, that straight edge pint glass that people just drink and not think about it. And so hopefully this gives people that a little bit more time to really contemplate and think about, you know, the pub that they're in, the atmosphere around them and what they're drinking. So, yeah, I completely agree. Now is now is the time for Cascade. Now is the time. Yeah. Certainly. Um, great talking to you. Uh, and I hope everyone enjoys listening to this. Uh, they know where to find you. If I, you know, Do you have a social media? Yeah. So Sharps Brewery and Ed Beer Sommelier for, for my Instagram. Um, but yeah, go to the brewery. And more fantastic sort of evangelism about the wonders of flavour in beer, particularly Catskill, and how it relates to food. Fantastic. And I'm Pete Brown Beer on all the socials. Uh, hope uh, you've enjoyed watching this. Um, Ed, a pleasure as always. Cheers. Pete. See you soon. Cheers. Cheers. We didn't even rehearse that. That's fantastic. No, we didn't. I was good. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Cheers. <laughs>